All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. How's everybody doing today? Feel good? Everyone's like, oh, oh, they're doing a session. I gotta like pay attention now. I'll stop reading my Twitter feed. I thought this was a place to take a nap after lunch, right? <laughs> all right, everybody, thank you all for coming. We're here to talk about spring. Duh, this is the spring conference. And we're gonna talk about Sencha. Now really this fits into the idea of spring IO, the whole kit and caboodle, really at the core level. We're gonna talk about some of the things that make it easy to build mobile apps to really provide data and give it in the context of an example. First off, who the heck are these guys? My name is John Ferguson. I'm a senior field engineer at Pivotal. I am formerly an enterprise data and application architect in the financial services. I love musical theater. I enjoy cats. And I enjoy internet memes, as you will see very quickly as we get started. That's actually his cat, too. So it wasn't just something he grabbed offline. <laughs> Although that wouldn't be the first time. However, I'm also joined by Luke Crocker. Yes, uh, senior sales engineer at uh, Sentia, and uh, uh, background in enterprise uh, and geospatial uh, applications, and uh, of course enjoy playing the straight man to the pivotal uh, wacky guy. So what are we doing here? Well, first we're going to talk about what the heck is Sentia. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may even use it. There's Sentia. There's XJS. There's Touch. There's what is it? So we're going to explain that and clear all of that up. But isn't this a spring conference? So we're going to talk about what's the spring part here? What do we care about? What matters? What are we actually going to go after? And then we're going to dance for all of you. We're going to build our demo live on stage. We're going to deploy it to Cloud Foundry and have all of you start playing around with it. We're going to touch upon Sentia Architect. And Lou's going to go into what that actually is. It's going to be out there. You guys can play with it. You can toy around with it. You can try and break it if you'd like. I hope you don't. But then we're also going to kind of finish everything up by saying, well, that's child's play. Let's build a real application. What's that actually look like? And we'll talk about Spring Trader, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a reference architecture for Pivotal and Pivotal technologies. So I'm going to hand it over to Lou. He's going to give you guys kind of a, an intro and a history to uh, Sencha, and we'll go from there. So I'm about to write one. Uh, write one. Okay. So the uh, Sencha. So what, what is Sencha? People have, as, as, as John has mentioned, people have heard of it, uh, JavaScript frameworks. So the, the current problem that we're seeing uh, in the market, this is a build, let me just finish the build here. Oops, one too far. Is uh, the, the end users <clears throat> and consumers are demanding a universal application experience. And very often, they want these uh, HTML5 applications to look like uh, a native application that they would download off of the uh, iPhone app store or out of the Android store. Uh, they want the same app functionality everywhere, uh, and they want experiences that are tailored for both the desktop uh, and the tablet. They don't want a website uh, that they would use uh, a mouse uh, to navigate uh, to show up on their tablet, because the tablet has touch capabilities, so they want the touch capabilities in there. And uh, for as far as developers go, uh, they're facing the challenges of building these universal apps that have these experiences, that provide the mouse experience when it's needed, that provide the touch experience when it's needed. They need to run everywhere, uh, and they need to be managed on disparate platforms. Uh, there's not much IE6 left, thank God, but there is some out there. There's certainly IE7 and 8, all the way up to Chrome, IE11, uh, and, and the variations thereof. So there's quite, I mean, even the Google Glass, your refrigerator, et cetera. We've all seen these. Uh, the desktops, laptops are now coming with touch screens, and, and uh, so you've got all these disparate experiences uh, that, that, that users are looking for. So our mission, quite simply, is, to, uh, the, is the rapid and easy development of rich uh, web applications for the broadest range of devices that run in the browser from IE6 uh, all the way to the latest uh, table. I suppose to say tablet, but anyway. I tried. It is. So how do we do this? So we do this by, uh, by building um, HTML5 frameworks, that is JavaScript, CSS, uh, and, and HTML uh, on, for the different platforms. We have uh, three, three main frameworks, really two main frameworks and sort of a, a third framework that we, that we maintain because it's popular in some of our financial sector, uh, that being GXT, which rides on top of GWT, which we, don't, we, we have for about 25% of our users. But XJS and Sentia Touch uh, share a common namespace. They share uh, a common design. 
Uh, XJS is our, uh, some of you may be familiar, the company actually used to be called XJS until about three years ago when we changed it to, to Sentia. Uh, that is our mouse-enabled framework. Uh, although we are bringing, as we announced at our conference in, in, in July, we are bringing uh, some touch events uh, to the uh, XJS specifically for the tablet use case. Uh, so we, we look at the tablet use case sort of as a crossover experience. Uh, could be full touch, uh, could be a website that, that you rendered that would normally be navigated via a mouse. Uh, and so we're kind of crossing that over uh, with XJS. Uh, the Sentia Touch was written from the ground up to take advantage of the latest uh, capabilities in all the latest browsers. There is no IE, for example, uh, as we all know, on the, well, on, on, the, on the Surface tablets, of course, it's IE 10. But the older IEs, uh, where, you know, IE with all its funkiness, uh, probably more, almost half of our library at XJS is, is to deal with, with, with uh, the funkiness of IE browsers. Uh, so when we got to touch, we were able to build it from the ground up to take advantage of all the CSS animations uh, and all of the latest capabilities. Uh, much smaller library, uh, touch enabled. Uh, the architecture. We have an MVC architecture which uh, enables the building of uh, particularly teams uh, working on uh, separate parts of the application uh, to really build a well-formed, uh, easily maintainable, easily extensible um, application uh, through the use of, of, of routes and, and uh, control queries and all sorts of different, there's many different ways to do it um, with, through, you know, through the MVC, ar through our MVC architecture. But the idea at the end of the day is, is maintainability, scalability, and extensibility. Uh, and that's what the, with the, the MVC architecture. We have the robust uh, data APIs. We have many, many uh, proxies. We were talking about yesterday uh, with a group, we have proxies into, uh, we have REST proxies, we have RPC, uh, um, XML proxies, we have um, in-memory proxies, we have all kinds of proxies. The idea being that the, as a developer, you write to a consistent API and you don't really care how that API accesses your backend data. You simply uh, assign the proxy uh, to the system that you are uh, connecting to, and then it returns the data in a form that you can, that you can use, with, use a universal API to address. We have modern themes, rich UI widgets, all of the buttons, the uh, uh, charts, the grids with the spark lines, um, all, the, all the widgets you would expect. Uh, Plug-in free charting, of course we used to use flash charts, but now it's all rendered with, uh, with Canvas or VML. Uh, big data grids, we actually uh, recently released an uh, enhancement to our grid, uh, whereby we're able to handle large volumes of data uh, in a just-in-time fashion uh, as the user scrolls uh, while including all of our functional pieces for the grid, uh, such as inline editing, um, all of the uh, inline widgets, um, all the type of different, different uh, experiences you would expect a, gr a grid to deliver. Uh, and of course, the cross-browser platform uh, capability comes without saying, we handle that on the background for you. Uh, Sentia Touch, as we mentioned, is our touch-enabled uh, experience. Uh, High-performance mobile framework works very, very well. We, we, we put a lot of emphasis into performance. We spend, we have, we have teams that spend um, all their time analyzing the best way to create JavaScript uh, to touch, that when it touches the DOM, it is the most performant, uh, giving a native-like experience. We have themes for each platform. Uh, of course, the smooth, uh, the, the smooth scrolling and animations taking, care, taking uh, advantage of all the CSS3 and uh, and the uh, GPUs on platforms that provide those. Um, and multi-touch gestures, we actually had, as, as most of you probably know, um, on the uh, uh, mobile browser does not yet fully support natively all of the uh, pinch and zoom, all the, the, the uh, sophisticated swipe gestures. So we had actually had to write our own. Uh, and we, we support all of the long press, short press, double tap, uh, pinch, zoom, swipe, uh, all of the gestures you would expect to see in a mobile, uh, in a uh, touch-enabled uh, experience. And uh, of course, as, as you, uh, we don't really do uh, you know, adaptive design as some people think about it, but, but adaptive in the sense that you know, if, a, uh, if an application on an iPad, for example, goes from vertical to horizontal, we're able to, uh, in the same way that a native uh, iPad application will you know, sh uh, all of a sudden render the sidebar or make the sidebar disappear as a drop-down menu if you tilt it uh, into portrait, uh, and we're able to handle all those. Uh, Sentia Architect, which is a tool we'll be using when we actually build the, the, the demo, is our drag and drop uh, environment. Um, we think that this is uh, a very key to our offering. It's the front door to our, to our frameworks. As I often tell customers when I go out and, and meet with them, 
Uh, I know developers have this tendency to think that if they're not editing something in a, in a text editor or in an IDE, they're not doing anything. And, and there's a sort of code generation tools have, have, been, have received a bad name, I think for good reason at times over the years. The difference here is that the uh, resource constraints in an HTML uh, application on a browser, either on a mobile device, or even on the desktop, whether it's specifically if you're you know, dealing with IE, which we do with a lot of our financial uh, and, and insurance uh, institutions, it's very difficult for a developer who doesn't spend all of their time in the frameworks themselves to out-optimize what architect can deliver for you. Uh, in this, it's different. As I mentioned, from, from say, for example, uh, other tools that you may have used in the past to generate code, uh, you know, I remember in years, in years by using Dreamweaver, and Dreamweaver always had a bad reputation, although I love the tool for generating excess HTML and things like that. Um, this really generates the, the, the best practices optimal code. You have the ability to access every aspect of the, of the framework, either through the config panel or through the drag and drop, but it does it in a way where you cannot edit the actual view code in the designer uh, for the express purpose uh, of, of not messing it up. Uh, you, you have the ability to edit your, your event handlers, your custom functions, and as I said, through the properties panel, get at all aspects of, of the design of the application, and it really outputs um, something that's highly maintainable. I can pass it off to another developer. Uh, they can open it up in Architect, see exactly what I did, and continue on modifying from there. And we'll, sh we'll demo this uh, in just a bit. Great. Turn it back over to John. Thanks, Lou. So we're talking about Sencha, but we're at a spring conference. Why? Well, it's because as developers, we suffer from the I wear too many hats at my company syndrome. No, this is not my cat, but I did think it was a good picture. Because this is what you guys have to do, right? You're developers, you're building your spring applications, typically these are back-end focused, but then someone comes along and says, you know what, put a front end on that, we're gonna deploy it out to the mobile applications, and when we're done, it's gonna be great, right? Great. It's hard. So what do you do? How do you actually make it easy to try and build applications that look good, that are easy to use? And Sencha and Spring have this nice seamless integration so that you can take advantage of the fact that they've done a lot of work to make it easy for you guys to get started, to leverage architect. And that's why we're here talking to you guys. Because what you can do with Spring and how you use Spring today, particularly around building REST services, that's really useful and applicable to how we're actually going to build our mobile applications. Let's just agree, REST is how we get our data to our mobile applications. It's lightweight, it's easy to use, Sencha is ready to rock, it's ready to start using it. So I think we can all agree that REST is probably the way that we do it today. There's a lot of interesting things happening around this, around the ability to start you know, having reactive applications and all of that. But if you're going out there to build an app today, REST is how you want to get your data there. And I agree, when I build a mobile client, I use REST. So, very, very, very quickly, because most of you probably have already done this before, but how do we actually build REST in Spring MVC? Well, first, we want to add this annotation driven to our application context. Many of you are going, yes, John, I've done this a million times, you don't have to remind me, but maybe some people haven't seen this before. We can annotate our controllers with that controller, and really the magic here is to say at request mapping. We can start to specify what the value is, so what's the actual path look like? Are we using HTTP verbs? Can we actually say get or put or post or delete? And we can do that by actually giving that information into the request mapping annotation. And then we can say, I put request body, that's pretty silly, response body. Response body says, guess what? When I pull this data back out of this method, what am I actually returning? And I'm going to basically write just right to the response the object that I get. But because I did that annotation driven, I'm actually going to automatically register some of my converters. So if I want this to come back as JSON, I just need to have something like Jackson on the class path. So this makes it really, really easy to start building REST endpoints. And we'll talk about, we'll show you guys how that happens. Now this is a slide that I totally stole from Josh Long, who is way better at explaining all of this than I am. But it's basically, how RESTy do we need to be? You see, there's this thing called the Richardson maturity model, and basically it says, how resty is rest? What am I building? Am I building just something that's like remote? It's basically RPC, but over rest? Well, that's not easy to maintain. Maybe I want to start thinking about things in terms of resources. So I've got a Twitter, 
or I've got an account, or a client, or a product. These are resources. These are things that we want to actually act upon. But as we start to move up, maybe we want to start at thinking in terms of verbs. So if I want to get the information, I want to issue an HTTP get. If I want to create a new one, it's HTTP post. But I'm acting on resources. This makes our code much more maintainable. It also makes it much easier that when I'm building mobile applications in Sencha or any other technology, I can take advantage of this. It makes it much, much more easily done. Finally, there's this other thing, um, hypermedia controls or HadeOS. So how many people have heard of HadeOS before? OK, so good, good chunk of you. HadeOS is hypermedia as the engine of application state. Basically means we have a uniform interface and that in order to get around our model, to move between resources and find out what's available for our resources, we're provided these RELs. So because I stole his slide, I'm going to plug his YouTube video. So check out this YouTube video if you want a much better explanation. It's Josh Long talking about what is REST, going through some of this, and what Spring Data has done to really make REST really easy to use. So when we look at what we were talking about before, we think about terms of resources. So I've got slash resource slash ID. So I'm going to issue a get, so I'm at that level two now, on a resource. And it's going to pull back for me an actual resource, Java object. And because I've annotated, I don't know why I wrote request body. I apparently can't think of request and response in the same sentence. But it's just going to automatically convert that to JSON for me because I've given it that an MVC annotation driven. So that's really nice. So for those of you who haven't actually used Spring MVC to generate REST endpoints, this is really cool. And it's black magic. So some things we want to think about. These are some of those best practices, tips, little tricks that we've kind of found after we build applications, after we start kind of connecting Sencha and Spring together. The models matter. If you take one thing away from today, it's that the models matter. Make sure that whatever your service is returning and whatever you're using on the Sencha side, those models are matching. REST consistency matters. You can't just change the URLs because you think one looks prettier than the other. And you've got to think about thinner objects. When you're thinking about designing your object model for mobile applications, you don't want to send this big monolithic object over the wire. These things are not expecting to get huge amounts of data. Sure. We've moved to 4G. This gives us a lot more bandwidth. Maybe we don't have to worry about this as much. But you really should be thinking about sending small, thin messages to your clients so that the speed is high. Also, JSONP is your friend. Use it. Leverage it. If you're building in Sencha Architect like we're about to, then you're going to want to be able to leverage JSONP because someone might deploy a service somewhere that's on a totally different site. And you might want to take advantage of it in Sencha Architect or something. And we found that after building our application and testing it out, it made it much easier to actually start doing things and iterating and starting to build things by leveraging JSONP. So I'll take a moment right there. Does anybody have any questions on what we've talked about? Anything about um, my pretty face? I don't know. Anybody, any questions? Yes? It is available now. We, we're, it's in uh, version 2.2 right now. Version 3.0 will be in beta September 19th, and then will be available to GA uh, on, uh, uh, at the end of October. So the main uh, feature uh, ads there will be uh, s uh, theming within the, uh, within the designer. It will be uh, added support for, at that point, be two, uh, Sencha Touch 2.3, which adds a, uh, adds a grid. Uh, also, uh, some uh, code completion. And I'm missing one, but I don't remember what it is. But, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a, the tool right now, as it is, is excellent. I think three, version 3 takes it to, oh, I know what it is. Actually, we've had a lot of requests from our uh, uh, enterprises that they want to actually share components. And Sencha, as a framework, is highly componentized. Everything's a component. And so what we've had some of our enterprises do is actually create like, um, uh, I don't want to use a name, but a, a central uh, a grid, for example, that, ha that adds behaviors. It might add a, a data source URL, might add some custom theming, and then they're going to export that and then re-import it into uh, Architect to be used. And, and oftentimes, particularly some of the organizations that offshore, drop everything out of the toolbox except what they want their developers to use. So this is a feature that we've added for, for three.
Yes. This is such a question. Does Sentra Architect, is that a vendor that supports GXT? No. No, GXT is, yeah. That's correct. E EXTJS and Sentry Touch, that's correct. Good question. Anybody else? So how many people here are using Sentra today? Oh, a lot of you. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, that's good. That's great. And are you guys connecting them to Spring backend, mostly? Yes, yes. OK, cool. So I'm going to build a demo that basically does exactly what you're already doing at your job and you've seen 100,000 times. OK, I'm now really excited about this. <laughs> so no, we're going to build something on stage. We want to do something interesting, right? right? We'll Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to build an app. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to do Twitter because it's spring 1, 2012. Actually, oh, it's no, 2013, it's but that's okay. Okay, no You're problem. a year early or late. Hey, no. at least the keynote, they talked about it last night, so I don't feel so bad. So we're going to build a Spring REST backend. It goes out to Twitter, pulls down some data based on a query, and presents it out as JSON. Okay, no problem. We're going to wrap it in JSONP so we can have this cross-site uh, JSON. And then Lou has volunteered to build a Sentia Touch front end in front of all of you so that you can all um, harass him and harangue him as he's building it. <laughs> So what are we going to do? One does not simply build a back end. Well, if any of you are familiar with Spring Templates, and I saw the boot thing at Keynote, and I went, crap, my demo's now even worse, that's OK. But Spring Templates make it really easy, if you're in Spring Source Tool Suite, to, to just create a Spring MVC application like we're going to do. We're going to sprinkle in a little bit of Spring Social. So if you're familiar with that, that's how we're going to connect out to Twitter. And then we'll have data. But we'll need to build a UI first. So let's actually go through this entire exercise together. You can all look at my coding skills that are absolutely atrocious, which is why I copy and paste from previous projects. <laughs> so first, I'm going to go to project. I'm going to pick Spring Project. If you've never done a template um, in Spring Source Tool Suite, this is how you get started with it. So you click Spring Project. It gives you a list of options, some stuff around batch, some stuff around Gemfire and integration. But let's go for something simple, Spring MVC Project. We're going to call it Spring Sencha Awesome, because I think it's going to be awesome if I could spell. We'll click Next, com.spring.sencha. So all I've done here is just name my project, pick almost like a Maven archetype kind of, but just really easy through SDS. And it's going to create an application. It's going to pull down all my dependencies. It's a Maven application. And if I go inside my palm, I've got all the sort of standard things that I would want to use if I'm building an MVC application from scratch. So this makes it really easy to get started, except that I saw Boot the other night and I went, wow, that's even easier. OK, thanks, Dave. Let's update to 3.2.4. We want to bring in Spring Social. So like all good developers, I'm lazy. So I've already built this project to test out so I can just copy and paste things over. So Spring Twitter version. We're going to grab the snapshot, the property, because I like properties, and that's good coding practice. This is the dependency. So any of you have, have never done Spring Social, um, it's org spring framework social, Spring Social, and we're going to grab the Twitter package. So I'm going to pull that over as well. And because I'm grabbing a snapshot, I'm going to make sure I've got the right repositories. How many people have actually used Spring Social before? Interesting. Well, good. I'm showing you something new. Um, Spring Social is really great if you need to interact with ta-da, Spring uh, Social APIs. So if you need to connect to Twitter, if you need to connect to Facebook or LinkedIn because you're pulling in data, you're doing sentiment analysis on your customers because that's really the cool thing to do these days. Spring Social makes it really nice and easy to have an integration pattern to go out and get all of that data. So I should be good to go there. As part of this little template, it creates a controller for me. So just like we saw when I was descri describing how you build REST, right? It has an annotation at controller. Great. There's a request mapping. It says slash. So whenever we just go to the app, it's going to return this as long as we're issuing, issuing a get request. So what I'll do here is we'll do a request mapping. 
And we'll say value is equal to Twitter. So I'm defining my resource and the action I want to take on it. Can you make that a little bigger? Oh, uh, I could try. Oh, yeah, that worked real well. Oh, no. Come on. Give me something nice here. You would think that zoom was obvious. I'm sorry, what? General, where is it? Basic. Uh, you guys know this better than I do. Where am I going? Everybody's like, don't tell them. Let them struggle. Crap. I thought there was a nice way to do it. Um, yeah, well, you can't read that at all. Source. So help me through this again. So if I type font, oh, look, at he's going to come up and actually help me. Yay, everybody give a hand, round of applause for the gentleman that's helping us. Yay. Sorry. Is that a little better? A little more? This is how we kill time to make up the 90 minutes, just so we're clear. Is that better? We all kind of see that one? OK, great. Thank you very much. All right, so request method dot get. And we're going to say, hey, we want a response body. So whatever, whatever object comes back, when you marshal it, just write it out straight to the response. So this is, if you're used to like old school MVC where you return a string and that gets mapped to like a JSP or something, this response body overrides that. So that what actually comes back is real data. So we'll say search, call it method. Oh no, we need to return a JSON P object because I said um, you should do it. So just take my saying to do it. Search at um, request param. So this is how we're pulling things out of after the question mark. So we're going to have a thing called callback. Because if you're doing JSON P, that requires that you have a callback. Uh, string callback. Da -da 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 -da. Come on, there we go, callback. And we'll have another one we're going to call query. So we've defined this, this rest endpoint, string query, as whatever my app is, slash Twitter, slash search p.json. And I'm expecting in my, my query string to have a thing called callback that I'm going to use to enable JSON p and a thing called query, which is going to be what I send to Twitter. So I won't let you struggle anymore by having to watch me just do all of this stuff. Let's actually grab some, some Spring Social code. OK, great. So what this is, everything checks out, good, is I've got a Twitter template. All right, so if you're familiar with JDBC template, right? We've all kind of used that in the past. Twitter template is very similar. You instantiate your template, 
you give it some information, and these are like your access tokens. So if you're used to dealing with Twitter, you know that there's consumer keys and tokens and access tokens and secrets. So this is mine, don't copy it. Um, but then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, Twitter template, um, you have search operations. Let's execute a search on those operations with the query that I've gotten in for my REST endpoint and give me the last 10 results. Okay, no problem, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go get those tweets, and then I'm gonna wrap them inside a JSONP object. So when you create a JSONP object, which by the way is, is built right into um, Jackson, you have to give it a callback, which is the actual text that you've gotten that's been given to you by whatever application you're building, and then you give it the object that you want it to wrap in. So at this point, we should be pretty good to go. So we've got a controller, nice and simple, and let's see how this works. I'm going to try and deploy this to Cloud Foundry. Here's the risky part. We're gonna call it SS Awesome123. And I don't need to bind any services. Here's hoping that we're gonna have an actual REST endpoint out there in Cloud Foundry. So what it's gonna do, how many people are familiar with Cloud Foundry? How many people have never heard of it before? Putting you on the spot. Good, if you haven't heard of it before, then you would be living under a rock. <laughs> I don't understand how that would be possible. Cloud Foundry, platform as a service, it's awesome, it's cool, it's easy for us to build our applications, it's easy for us to deploy our applications. In particular, when you're building applications for mobile, you need to have your services available. If you're doing dev, if you're doing test. So in our example, we wanna be able to have an application it's out there in the cloud so that when Lou takes over and does the things that look cool instead of the things that I do, he can actually hit the REST endpoint. He can actually do something with it. So right now that's gonna go through the whole staging process, which takes a little bit of time. But before I move on and, and turn it over to Lou, does anybody have any questions on what I've done so far? Pretty straightforward, right? We built a REST service, we went out to Twitter, we're gonna pull down some data based on a query, and we're gonna go. Questions? No? Oh, you guys are easy. Okay, great, while that's going, I'm gonna switch it all over to Lou, and he's gonna do the things that are way sexier than what I do. Thank you. So we're gonna uh, pull up <clears throat> Architect here, which I already have open once we get, and we're hoping that the screen resolution, which we had to monkey with to get this all to show up properly, will render shortly. And ah, so it works. So everybody can see, um, and I, I actually, as I was watching John struggle with the Zoom, I actually went out and, and, and Googled how to Zoom a Mac, so I actually have mine <laughs> set up now, so I can actually Zoom if we need to. Um, and, and so uh, basically uh, what, what uh, uh, John has built uh, is, is right here. So. Uh, this is the, actually, this is the service uh, that we uh, built uh, earlier today, uh, the exact same way, but we had a little trouble with Cloud Foundry. And you know what? So. They're not going to believe me because they're going to be like, all right, that's a different URL. If you actually change the, the Spring Twitter to SS Awesome123. All right, we'll, we'll save you. We'll save you in just a I'm minute. just, we'll yeah, just... I want you people to believe what I'm doing up here. It's not all smoke and mirrors. Absolutely. So <laughs> this is the, this is actually the, the, the Twitter uh, JSON result that came, uh, that is coming from the, 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 the Spring MVC REST service. So by a show of hands, how many of you would like to read your Twitter feed every day this way? Anybody? No. So now what we do is we uh, try to put uh, a front end that makes sense onto, uh, on, onto the JSON. And we do this with uh, Sentia Touch uh, and uh, building the application in Architect. As you see the architect tool here, it looks familiar to other environments that you might have seen in the past. Left-hand side is your, is your toolbox, and these, are, of course, are all configurable. And by the way, uh, uh, Sentia Architect is downloadable with a free 30-day uh, trial. Uh, it builds both the XJS and Sentia Touch applications. If you go to uh, Sentia.com, you're able to download it. Um, so it, it, the center part of this uh, is actually uh, looks, of course, like your, your phone or a mobile device. 
actually a running WebKit browser. So one of the unique aspects of, of the architect tool is that when you're building the application, it's actually running as it would be in a browser because, in fact, uh, the, the center uh, panel is a, is a, a WebKit browser. Uh, the, the tool itself is also all written in XJS and wrapped in our, in our uh, uh, native packaging tool. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the project inspector, which more or less maps to your file structure, not exactly, but uh, in, in a sense, it maps to the MVC file structure. And then the bottom uh, section over here you'll see is our properties panel that, we'll, that we will use uh, as we uh, go forward setting our properties. So what's the first thing that we're going to do? We've got a blank, uh, blank project that we've opened up. Uh, and Accenture Architect has the unique ability, I don't know if you're seeing you're unique or not, but I enjoy it, to uh, filter down both the controls, uh, the quick open, and also in the properties panel. So I'm going to search for um, a panel, which is uh, basically a, a container which takes over the viewport, and I'm going to drop it onto, uh, onto the designer there. Uh, after that, I'm going to, because I want to know what it is I'm looking at in this application, I'm going to search for a title bar, and I'm going to drop, drop the title bar uh, onto the application. I'm then going to double click uh, on the title bar itself and I'm going to say, uh, oops, I'm going to say spring, since it is the spring conference, we'll put spring first. Sencha, <laughs> uh, oops, tweets. So there I have uh, the, the title of the application, it's the title bar that you would actually uh, see on the top of the application. So now we need a place for these tweets to actually be rendered. So I'm going to go back to my uh, to my toolbox, and I'm going to find my I'm going to find my list component, and I'm going to drop my list component on uh, right now. And as you'll see, you doesn't look very impressive. It's just kind of what is it doing? And that is because I can I need to cut, come into my uh, panel, and I need to set my my layout actually to fit, which will actually fit the uh, uh, children uh, to the full view. So now you can see I have a list with some template items uh, in it, and uh, that is where my data is going, to, uh, is going to reside when it comes in. But I don't have any way yet to get the data into the application. What I need is two things in particular. I need a data store, whoops, if I could spell store properly, and I'm going to use JSONP store, as John was talking about uh, JSONP, because it allows me to do my uh, uh, cross-domain uh, requests. Uh, and these names are kind of silly, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and I'm going to name this as my Twitter store. And then I'm going to name my proxy in the same way. Uh, where's my, all right, so my display name is Twitter proxy. And then I'm going to name my reader. So what these represent um, is the, the actual store is the object. The proxy is actually the mechanism by which it goes out uh, and uh, retrieves the data, the data, sorry. Uh, and the reader is actually what uh, deserializes the response into the model, which we are going to add next. Uh, this is where I was mentioning a while ago that you, we have different proxies. I, we have, as you can see, uh, we've got different stores, and we've got, if I go and search for uh, proxies in my toolbox, you see I have Ajax, Direct, JSONP, Local Storage, Memory, REST, uh, SQL Proxy, and, and more. We have OData proxies. We have um, uh, proxies intended for use with Salesforce. We have a, a lots of, of different items, but the idea now is that I can code this application to a consistent API, and I, won't have to, uh, I don't have to worry about how those proxies actually do their work. So after the um, after the uh, I work on on the the, the actual uh, store, I need to tell it, as John mentioned, what the model looks like. What are the fields? Now, if I look back here at my uh, at my Twitter feed, uh, I can see there's a whole bunch of data here. Uh, now we could do a lot with this, and this is probably, as John mentioned, more data than we would bring back uh, in a normal application, but. Uh, because it's a demo and we all understand what Twitter is, we decided to do this. So I'm going to just go pick four fields out of here. Uh, I'm going to pick the ID, the text, the from user, and the profile image. So as I move down here, I'm dragging my, my model across, and I missed it, drag my model across and drop it on my models, and drop it on my models. There we go. And I'm going to name it to Twitter model, if I could spell. 
Okay, so now the next thing I need to do is I need to add those fields I mentioned. As I scroll down uh, to the, to, uh, and this again, this is the properties panel down here. So I could actually type in here, I could, I know I want to get my, I, I want to add fields. So I type down to my field. Can, by the way, uh, is this, can people read this? Is this uh, too small? It's too small? Okay, so we will, all right, there we go. Wait, it's that easy? Well, oh you have to God. set it up properly. I thought I'd let you struggle for a while. So I go to the fields, and I'm going to click on, uh, I'm going to click on the plus sign. I'm going to add ID. I'm going to click on the plus sign again. I'm going to add uh, text. And in this case, the uh, case does matter. Uh, I'm going to add, a, add from user, and I'm going to add, uh, oops, uh, profile image. I have to spell it properly, URL. And that should be, that should be correct. All right, yes? How does that work with Nested Object? Uh, you, have, you have a mechanism by which you create the models and then you relate the models. It's a, it's a not to, no pun intended, but it's a, a relational model. Uh, and you assign one model with its children and then you can assign them to lists and they do all kinds of things. Yeah, we have all the facilities to deal with that. Uh, and then, as you'll see, I've got this uh, red warning or error icon, and this means if I mouse over it, it says invalid configuration, um, uh, click for details, and if I click it, it'll say, please associate a model with this store, because it doesn't know the, what the proxy is supposed to be deserializing into uh, until I give it a model. So if I type in model, if I, select, if I select the store and type in model, you'll see down here again that it's bringing up uh, my model uh, property, and then I can click in the right-hand side, in the drop-down box, and it already knows, the project knows what the models that are available to be used. And if I had multiple, it would list them all. In this case, I only have one, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to select Twitter model. I'm actually going to save the project at this point in time so I don't uh, lose anything and have to start over again. Uh, and so that's what we've got so far. So, so, so far what we've done is we've created a container by using a panel. We've added a title bar. We've added a list. We've added a store, which is where we're going to bring the data back. We've added a model, which tells the, the store how to deserialize the data. Uh, and we've got a simple uh, placeholders in the list. Uh, are there any questions so far before we actually go and try and, and get some real data? Yes. I'm sorry, what the what is? Dynamically determine what the fields are. Like, for example, if you're, because you deal with a lot of RESTful services, they're not built in Spring, they tend to take your students. Mm -hmm. When the model and the fields change, then what do you mean the GXP and the new binding and all that? What happens here if fields, one of the fields is passive and it's not in the service? So is not, if the field is not in the service or if you need to add fields that are not defined? Well, if you, if you went to the URL, right, and you found what field you were looking for. Correct. So what if, what if um, Twitter basically changes the name of the field and that's actually one that you're pulling back here? Is, is, does the application, how does it handle it? So well, it, 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 it'll, it'll just, it, it just won't match. So it's, it's not going to throw an error. It just won't match anything. You, it'll be blank. Now, if they change all of them, obviously your, your list is going to be blank. If they change some of them, it's going to parse the ones that match, and it's going to forget about the others. So, so it won't necessarily, if, if I understand, it won't, the app won't blow up to basically recall the problem like that one there. Yeah, it, it, it won't blow up. Yeah, it, 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 it might, there, there are probably certain, certain circumstances where it might blow up. For example, if you were actually trying to go and, and get that field for, uh, and use it as a parameter or something, that, that could be a situation. But in a simple deserialization uh, situation, it just will skip it. It says, I don't know what you're talking about. And it won't, it won't but it won't crash. Any other questions? Nope. So uh, after what we have done here, we need to tell the proxy, which is, which is the mechanism by which we are actually going to, uh, it's the uh, asynchronous uh, module, actually. So, so what I need to do is I need to take and I need to assign to this, uh, oops not an I URL, but a URL. Uh, and I have actually a little cheat sheet down here that I, uh, where I'm going to copy this same URL that we just looked at in the browser, and I'm going to paste it into the 
into the, uh, into the properties. So what I can do now is I can actually go up and I can actually uh, right click on the store and I can actually load data. And there may be, a, and it, so this little eye mechanism, if you can see it on the right hand side, tells me that 10 records were loaded and I can click to view the response. Now there was a bug in here, so yeah, and there still is a bug. So this is something that actually, it will actually bring your data back in there. Uh, uh, version three, I have to tell the guys there's a bug in there. But anyway, that, so that's how, you, but the eye tells you that 10 records were loaded. It knows there's 10 records in, in data. And that's all wonderful, but it's still, I, I still don't see anything in, in, my, in my app here. So what do I have to do? So I need to go up to my list, and I need to click the uh, gear, and I need to come down here, and I need to select the store. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the Twitter store. And all of a sudden, you see my, my items disappear. Now, why did that happen? That happened precisely because of the question you asked. If when I go and look at the item, the item template, and I switch to my code view, it's looking for something called string. And there is nothing called string in my model. So what I need to do currently, this is, and we're going to have just a really ugly model at first here. I mean, ugly uh, template at first here. I'm going to put, for example, I'm going to put text. And then I'm just going to be really lazy, uh, like John. And as and, um, a matter of fact, he's my model. And so now I, I'm going to copy and paste. And I'm going to add uh, down here, I'm going to add from user. And then I'm going to do it one more time. And I'm going to add. Uh, the pro, actually, I'm going to skip the well. I'm going to skip the profile image because I need to do an image tag. I don't want to waste time. So now I do that, and then if I if I go back to my design, and I I I still don't see anything. So what I need to do is I need to go to to my store again, and I need to oops select auto load. So once I select auto load, you'll see oh there we go. We have some live data in our UI. Now. I don't know about you, but that's pretty ugly. I mean, that's, you know, I can't even tell what I'm, what, what I'm supposed to be doing there. But we do have live data. So what can we do about this? So the next thing that we need to do uh, is to uh, turn my notes page so I don't skip anything, uh, and then change the template to something that makes some sense. Now, I have done this, and, and John will attest to the fact that we actually spent a good bit of time the other day remembering how to do call span. So, uh, which I had completely forgotten about because I don't write much declarative HTML anymore. It's all in JavaScript. But we did figure it out and we conquered it. So if I go in here into my item template and I simply cut and paste and I'll save and then I will go back. Aha, now I have something that actually looks like worth viewing. And this is actually live data coming back uh, and if I refresh it, it will absolutely refresh. And if I preview, um, I will actually be able to preview and move my list up and down. And everything is honky-dory, except for the fact that the only thing, this, this is Twitter. And we want to search for certain things. And I do, it's, my URL is hard-coded to uh, S2GX, which is fine while we're here, but when we leave, uh, we might actually want to look at something else. So how do we actually do that? What we'll have to do is we'll have to go back into the store, I'm sorry, into the proxy, and search for the URL, and go to the very end of the URL, and we will remove the query. And when I do that, my data all of a sudden disappears. So what I then need to do is I then need to come over and add a toolbar to the top, and then so that I have something to type into my search, for example, I want to uh, add a text field, and then I need some way to trigger that text, so we're going to add a button, so we're going to put a button over here. Now that's pretty lousy, right? I mean, if my text is off, my button's off the side, field, what is field? That's so 1990s, we don't do that anymore, so we'll just take field, we'll back that out, that'll shift the text field over. And what I'll do, so how do I know? And now we know here that that's for, for, for searching. And uh, what, I, but what I want to do here, what we see uh, is enter something that's going to prompt me. So in my placeholder, I'm going to add some placeholder text that's going to say enter, enter your search string. 
Now, because this is all HTML and CSS, it's going to flow and move and push and, and all these types of things. But this is no good because my phone is a certain size and I can't expand my phone to see where the button is. So what we have uh, a property on uh, our elements called flex. So if I look for flex, now flex is a property that will basically take the area in which the, the container resides and sort of flex. I could set them to one and one, which would be 50-50, or in this case, I'm going to set the flex on the text box to three, and I'm going to go to the button. I'm going to set the flex on the button to one. And that's going to kind of give me uh, a three quarters, one quarter, you know, sort of layout for, for this, the, uh, the toolbar. I'm then going to go into the button. I'm going to say search because this is the button I'm going to click when I want to do the search. But it's all kind of you know bluish and it's not very contrasty and I kind of don't like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the button and I'm going to change my UI style. So, hmm, what do I want? I want to, uh, I think I picked as a matter of fact, confirm round. There we go. That looks good. So it stands off now. I can see my search button. So I'm going to do confirm round. Now all this is and it's telling me that I have an error because I took the parameter off. Now all this is, of course, CSS, HTML and CSS underneath it all, so really that's just a CSS style I just assigned, but it has the effect of changing the color of the, color of the button. Now it doesn't do anything though, right? So I can click the button and I still don't see my data. So I need to go down into my, into my button and what I actually need to do two things. I need to take my text field and I need to set the ID on the text field to txt search. So I know how to get at it. I know how to get the, the contents of that field. Um, I, I, by force of habit and best practices, I usually give all my elements IDs. And so I go to ID and I call this btn search. Now I could do different things. It turns out in this, I'm sorry, go ahead. The, you mean the, the dynamically generated item ID that the framework gives you? The, oh, oh, the opposite. The ID is the dynamically generated framework. You can give your components an item ID. Well, yeah, no, you're right. So, so either one will work. I always do ID okay. because if you give it an ID, it will overwrite the uh, generated one from the framework. Right. And uh, either one will work. I guess by force of habit, I just use ID, but, but either, one will, either one will work. So I give it a button search. I've got text search. I could do the rest of them, but I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to waste your time here. And so then, what I need to do is I need to go into um, uh, into and add an event binding here. And what I'm going to do a basic event binding. This is where I could also add a delegate event binding and push things to the controller and build a full MVC, which is for another day. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on tap, uh, and I'm going to add on button search tap. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that actual event handler and I'm going to go to my code. And so I'll have a, a function that uh, shows me what the parameters are, but it, I have to, here's where I, I can't, uh, as I mentioned, we don't want to modify, <coughs> bless you, we don't want to modify the uh, display code, but we do want to modify our event handlers. So I'm going to copy this code that I've written previously. I'm going to paste it in here. Basically what this is doing uh, is doing a, uh, a component query to, uh, it's actually not even doing, it, it's doing two things. Um, it's going to uh, get the store and then do a component query on the, uh, on the text field. And then it's gonna set the extra parameter, which is setting the parameter for the proxy to um, the value that you have entered in the text field and then it's going to call the load on the uh, Twitter store, which is going to call the load on the REST service that, that John wrote. So let's see if it works, because it worked yesterday, and it might work today. We'll see. <laughs> so we're going to actually go. So we've actually, uh, we've actually now, uh, just to review, uh, we've taken uh, the, the hard-coded parameter off of the URL. We have added a search box and a button to trigger a search based on the, uh, the uh, text entered into that search box. And we are expecting that when I put something in here, it's actually going to return uh, whatever it is that I search for. For example, if I were to search for beer, 
uh, and I now I have beer. I have beer. If I were to search for, um, for example, uh, spring one, uh, let's search for spring one, and we have spring one. So now we have what is ostensibly a fully functioning Twitter search application that will run uh, in a browser on any platform uh, you wish to write it on. Cool. So that's, that's pretty cool, right? Well, let's put it on Cloud Foundry. Let's actually screw with it. So here, if you want to put that on there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your a little... Go right ahead. Here. While you're doing that, I will get the code for you. So if you're going to... If you're going to build these applications and you want to build them correctly, you're going to separate your presentation tier, you're going to separate your services tier, but we're at Spring One and we're demoing, so we're going to combine them. <laughs> when you do that, though, there's a couple of things you need to think about. First, static resources. This is JavaScript. If we're talking about Spring MVC, then we're talking about you know, this really nice server container and all these good things, but we want to serve up some static resources. So first, we have to change a couple things in our application. Uh, hold on, I'm going to get you something. By the way, while you, were, uh, while you were sitting there, I did have to learn how to do this stupid Zoom thing. <laughs> uh, displays, scaled, because they told me what I'm supposed to set it to. Show the OSSCs. Okay. So, what are we going to change? So we have our Spring Sencha Awesome application. We've got a servlet context. We've got some static resources. So let's change this to app because perfect. What he's given me basically is, is all of the JavaScript code, the theme code, the basic HTML page that's going to do our rendering. So at least that's what he promised to do. Let's see if he did it. Shh. This looks familiar. OK, great. So we have an app folder. All right, let's pull that in. We'll put it under web app. Copy. That looks great. We've got our theme folder, so we're going to bring that over. And then we've got two files that we need. And these are going to be app.html and app.javascript. So if you're familiar with building such applications, XJS applications, this all feels pretty good. So we've got our app. It has the model, the store, the view. We've got our theme information, so it's all the CSS that we need. But we need to make sure we need to get at them, right? Because Spring MVC usually blocks these kinds of things. So we're going to do app. We're going to do theme. And because we have things at the root, we need to also say, hey, by the way, there's some static resources at the root. So make sure I can get those as well. So I brought his code over. I put it into my exact same Spring project. And I'm going to take the delightful risk of redeploying this out to Cloud Foundry. So does everybody see what I've done so far? So I took his code, I took the app folder, I took the theme folder, I took the app.html, I took the app.js, and I brought them into my Spring application, and now I've got something that, that should be a full-blown application. So let's see if Cloud Foundry says, oh, staging, great, so we can ask questions. Questions so far, right? We've seen a lot of stuff. Yes? So that was just developed with um, Sensor Touch, right? Yes. Sure. We're going to show you. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you can hit the URL, you can, you can access it from a, from a web page. Yep. yep. So we're going now, it's, it's, going to have, it's, it's going to have the look and feel of a mobile application. Um, it's not going to, you know, we could have also built this application in XJS with a grid and other types of things as well, um, and that would look different. Yes? Uh, it's actually a good question. Um, and the answer is, can I give the answer to that one? Yes, the answer is yes. We have looked at that and we're, uh, we are uh, working uh, with, uh, which one of the reasons why we're here is that we're working on a close collaboration uh, with, uh, with Spring to enable this to be more, a more seamless experience for you. Yep.
Great. Any other questions? Yes. So when I um, let me actually, so I'll answer your question in a quick second. I just want to get this uh, started. I did have to change that URL in his uh, Twitter store, so it's going to actually go to the local one. So I've got my Spring app. It's going to be all you know warred together, and that's what I'm going to deploy out to Cloud Foundry. But inside that war is going to be all of the JavaScript code that is his application. And that's why I changed this URL, because I want it to actually go against the local one. So let's uh, update and restart. So does that answer your question? OK, great. You changed it to local. I changed it to local, yep. If you didn't want it to be local and you wanted it to be somewhere else and then you know, asking something else, do the cross-site. That's why JSONP is useful. Because if you're in a development environment, you may be on one server somewhere, and maybe that's a different URL. Or if you're deploying to Cloud Foundry, maybe one is at one URL, one's at the other, and you have to worry about that whole cross-site thing, then JSONP is really your friend. That'll make it much, much more easy, much, much easier to do those kinds of things. So that's looking decent. So let's see what we got here. Great. So here's an app. Yes? So what would it take to this obviously a a mobile app? What would it take to have the same URL with a test on mobile app and more a like a desktop app for a desktop? You mean to, to if you accessed it from a desktop? Oh, what would it take to make it look like a desktop? So so they're they're So what it would take is you'd have to have uh, an intercepting endpoint that would then determine what the user agent was and, and send it to the proper application. You'd have to have separate applications because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Sentia Touch is written specifically to take advantage of a, of a, of a mobile uh, uh, experience, uh, heavily relying on, on, on the WebKit functionality for what it does in terms of animations and, and look and feel. So there, for example, there's nothing in there. It won't run in IE le lower than 10. It just won't, it'll just, the browser will just like explode. Um, and then uh, it, it also, it, and the browsers in which it will run, it, it will look like, I mean, it'll run in Firefox, it will run in Chrome, it will run in Safari, but it will, look like what it looks like now, like what he's got there. If you wanted to actually look like something with a grid, multi-column grid, although these, this is, is, is an interesting question because as we get more, as the frameworks get closer together in some of the different things, like we just introduced a grid uh, that's coming out in for touch. So some actual organizations, we do recommend uh, that they actually use such and such. If they don't have an IE dependency or a requirement, uh, they actually use touch and it works for some of them, whether to be on a desktop, because the, these this application will respond to mouse clicks, right? I mean, it will respond to mouse clicks. But if you want the widgets, like a tree widget, for example, the things that are inherent to a desktop experience, then you have to use the XJS framework, uh, and that would be then you'd have to have, like I said, an intercepting page that would determine. Well, really, you just have to parse the user agent and send it to the right place, right? Or what you could potentially do is, so the Spring Mobile Project will do that sort of detection of which agent it is. So it'll be like, oh, if you're going to be um, an iPad, if you're specifically iPad and, and you want to have something different, iPad to Windows to whatever, right? You can detect that. Or if you're saying, all right, if I'm being accessed from a desktop, which is, you know, these typical ones, then I can serve up my content one way or I can serve up my content another way. So Spring Mobile actually will help you do it if you're building some of your stuff here. And that's one of the things where you might want to actually combine your apps together so you can take advantage of some of that power. So um, Spring Mobile is something that you can check out for it. So here's what I want you all, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll have you, and I'll answer in a second. Here's what I want you all to do. This is the URL where the application is actually running right now. So if you pull out your phones and you go and you look at it, sweet, I love it. If you're on Twitter and you want to get your tweet seen up here, I wonder if someone will do it. Um, use the hashtag SS awesome, right? Because Spring and Sencha are awesome together. 
So go out, tweet, try this out, try out the application, do it now. Question. Oh, he's looking at his phone. He's like, wait, um, I'm looking. I, have, uh, I might have missed, but what, what is the callback you um, configured? What is the callback? I'm sorry, you're asking? So yeah, so in general, not in general, I don't know why I said that. What absolutely happens all the time is that the framework will assign a callback to the request. You don't have to do anything within architect, okay? What you have to do on the server side um, is uh, you, have to, you, have to, you have to look for the parameter called callback and you have to assign it to in this case, a variable, and then you have to wrap the response in that. But on the, on the designer side, you, you, don't, you don't have to do anything. It automatically adds it. As it does with things like cache busting and you know, all kinds of different things that it does that the framework handles for you, which you would expect. Cool. Has anybody sent any tweets? Uh, you mean with the pound sign? Oh, uh, no, not with a question mark. <laughs> it was more of a question. I told you, I like internet memes. These things are funny. <laughs> well, to me, they are. Everybody else in the audience is like, uh, dude, are you 12? I'm going to test the app. I'm scared. Is there anything there? Yes, yes, awesome. Here we go. Look at that. Yay! So here we go, right? We just built an application on stage at Spring One, and you all survived with us, right? This is good. This is awesome. Thank you all for tweeting at this. This is really nice. So if we go in and we look, you know, not afraid to tweet. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you are not afraid to do that. Um, no, is this cool? Does this have we raised beyond the bar of this doesn't suck, right? Is this okay? Yeah, we like this. This is good. This wasn't hard, was it? This was pretty easy, actually. I mean, despite the fact that we had some technical difficulties and I don't know how to zoom. But you do now. But I do now. See, you learn something new at Spring One every year. That's awesome. All right, cool, so we built it. This is easy. This is not hard. This is something that you guys can go home tonight, get into your jammies or your onesies, sit down with a cup of tea, and start actually building Sentia applications, right? We can do this. We can definitely do this. <laughs> so. However, is this something that we can actually do at the enterprise? Can we do this at our companies? Can we actually build these applications and use them and not feel like it's just a toy, right? Twitter apps, maybe your company works with Twitter. I'm sorry, but they're toys. They're fun. They're just, we're trying something out here. So what did we do? Well, at Pivotal, we partnered with Sencha to take our Spring Trader application, which some of you may be aware of. It's a, um, inspired by IBM's Day Trader. So we wanted a reference architecture where we could showcase a lot of the technologies that Pivotal uses. So Spring, obviously, RabbitMQ for messaging, SQL Fire for in-memory data grids, these kinds of things. But what we did is we partnered with Sencha, and we actually built a front end to it in Sencha Touch. So you can go to this URL right now. Um, whoop, hey, come back. It's uh, springtrader.gopivotal.com slash, let's see if I can, oh, I know a way to do this. Here we go. If you go there with your phone, you guys all read that, sort of? Um, this is a real application. This is not just something that we build on stage. This actually took real engineering effort. So what we ended up doing is, if any of you, how many people have actually looked at Spring Trader before as part of the Pivotal reference architecture? No? Okay, it's cool. It doesn't suck. So it's made up of a couple different tiers. We've got a presentation tier that then talks to our application services. These are exposing out REST endpoints. Then when information is coming in, we're sending it to some type of a message broker, and then that's going over and being consumed by our integration services. Both the application services and the integration services are talking to our data tier. So what are we doing here? Well. We're using SQL Fire at the bottom. So SQL Fire is an in-memory data grid technology. If you're familiar with it, it basically is SQL access into really high speed, low latency scalable data grids. On top of that though, we're using Spring and TC Server, which is basically enterprise Tomcat, to provide out these REST endpoints and services. 
We're using RabbitMQ to create this loosely coupled architecture where we send our messages back and forth. And then on the other side for integration, we're using Spring integration, Spring Batch to perform all this, this work. But what we did, what we changed, is we replaced this whole HTML front end. It was kind of some JavaScript, some stuff. It looked kind of boring with Sencha. We actually partnered with them. We sat down with them. It was an engineering effort. And now we have a legitimate, real application that is, is more than just something built with Twitter that you guys can reference today. So the code's out there on GitHub. Um, so you can go out there, look at it, look at what we're doing, look how we're integrating with Sencha and how Sencha's integrating back with Spring. But this is more than just Twitter. You guys can use this today. You can go back to your companies. You can start playing with it. And based at least on, on what I've seen so far, it seems like you're already all doing that. Yeah. Hmm? A little hard to read? Is that a little better? How about that? So, any questions, thoughts, concerns, death threats? Yes? Um, does the, like the cap command that you have to send a touch, is that something that behind the scenes the architect takes care of so that you're looking at it through um, like a desktop or like a normal web browser on a computer and knows that it relates to the tweet? Or is that just inherent to the cap? It, yeah, you can you can click it with a mouse and it will do what it's supposed to do. Yes. You don't need to write special code. No. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he, you you did that right when you did that search. Right. Right. I clicked so it here he actually clicked then... the search button with the mouse and it does what it's supposed to do. Right. Because I didn't know if behind the scenes the architect did something to you know the difference between the cap and the click or. Oh well, so I think there is a different event underneath underneath the covers. Um, because we can actually turn off mouse events for uh, touch if we want to. Um, but uh, to the developer, to the user, to whoever, it's, you don't have to do anything. It's, it's handled by the framework. Great. Yes? Um, how, uh, I'm sure you have um, many competition against native platforms, right? Uh, for mobile apps. I'm sorry, say what? I mean, you're sure what? Uh, how is it doing against native platforms? Uh, do you have any data? Native platforms are iOS, Android. Uh, it's basically using web technologies, but look and feel is like native. Right. So, uh, you know. It, it, Yes, we, we, we get a lot of interest, a lot, a lot of interest about uh, replacing um, uh, native technologies. As a matter of fact, we just did a case study on Genentech, where, you know, where they are, they're up, up uh, just north of the airport here, uh, I mean the SFO, where they actually had about 60 native applications. They replaced them all with Sentry Touch, um, 60, 6, 0. Uh, and in the financial space, in, in the insurance space, they, they really want to have, particularly if you don't need to touch the hardware at all, uh, and a lot of them don't want to go through the App Store acceptance process, um, we're getting a lot of people switching over. There are certain times where we recommend native. There's two ways to do it. You could have a hybrid experience through the use of Cordova or PhoneGap. We're actually with uh, Sentry Command 4. We are uh, actually uh, integrating with Cordova in the cloud so that you can actually push and it will build for all the platforms that you select. You can select them all if you want. Um, or you can do PhoneGap, which I've done for uh, uh, on projects where you actually uh, need to touch the hardware or need to have some sort of a native capability. When I did it uh, previously last year, uh, there was no way, uh, no good way in Sentry Touch to actually view, bring up a PDF and view it. So I actually did it in, in, in PhoneGap and actually uh, wrote a, had a view controller and put a web view on it and get that, you know all this kind of thing that, to make a PDF show. Um, but really, what we're seeing is the use case for replacing native is when they have to they're not touching the device and they have to support you know, like BlackBerry and Android and iOS with as close to the same code as, as possible. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of interest. There are a lot of apps out there being written. Um, you know, it just depends on what your use case is. Great question. Anybody else? Yes. So just sitting through the Angular JS and the Apple JS. Who? What? <laughs> Who? Who is that? <laughs> Model 
Well, I think that, that the biggest thing to understand about, about Sentia is, uh, and not really to, not really to, 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 to badmouth any libraries, because that's not really what, what, we're, what we're about. What we try and do is we try and provide um, a full framework implementation from the data transport all the way through the, the display widgets in a common namespace with an abstracted API that the developer writes, uh, to which the developer writes, that handles all of the underlying stuff for you. And these apps look and feel native. Now, the micro framework world obviously has a lot of frameworks within it, uh, several of which you just mentioned. They all tend to do one or two things well. I don't think there are any of them that do it all well. I think there are use cases uh, for them uh, in particular. I don't think, uh, for example, uh, you know, corporate presence websites or uh, progressive enhancement situations where you have uh, maybe thousands of pages of, of declarative HTML that you want to add some progressive enhancement to. I think jQuery is excellent for that, Angular, those types of, 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 of frameworks. But if you're looking to write um, a, a contained application with a comprehensive framework that's going to be enterprise mission critical using a lot of data and you don't want to try and maintain your own framework, what happens a lot of times with these micro frameworks is you as a developer of the application also wind up being a framework developer because you've got to piece this here and piece this here and what happens if that changes and things like that. So um, I think there are use cases for it, and particularly in the case of Angular, uh, there's no IE support below 9, 10, really. I mean, they'll run in 9, it'll crap out in 8, it won't do anything in, really in 8. I mean, it'll show up, but it'll run so slowly as to not be usable. But that's what they, that's their intent. Their intent is the latest browser. So I think, I think they all have use cases. Um, I, I think they all do certain things well. I don't think there's any of them out there that do comprehensively everything together. Um, and that's really what, what we, aim, uh, we aim to do. But having said that, we, we have customers that use us heavily and that in certain situations use some of the libraries you mentioned. And I certainly wouldn't recommend Sentia for every single use case, but um, we, there is none of those frameworks out there that have you know, 500,000 line applications, real-time day trading applications uh, on Wall Street today. Um, none of them do that, whereas we do. So I think that's something to take into, into account. Sure. Right, sure. Um, so what we've done, uh, and, and, and thus the difference between a complete framework and a, and a, and a slimmer framework. Of course, it's going to be bigger by, by nature and, and uh, by nature. So what we've also done, though, is with the release of Century Command 3 and then coming up 4, we have added very sophisticated class introspection capabilities that will look at your requires and parse out what you don't need. So you can actually create your own build of the framework that will slim it down by X percent depending on what you are and are not using uh, of the componentry, the, the widgets, uh, and, and the different classes. So that we actually see that, and that process uh, handles both the CSS and the JavaScript. Uh, and then, of course, the minification of that application. Um, I think inherently, uh, uh, XJS is always going to pro um, produce an application that's a little bit bigger because of the overall componentry and, and capabilities of the framework. But I think that um, the differences in, in, in speed are going to be negligible between the two, and the differences in uh, added functionality for XJS in many use cases are going to be the benefit in the, in, the, in the tipping factor. Is, that's what we're seeing. I'm sorry? Well, it's true. I mean, there's consistency, you know, in the enterprises, we hear um, that, you know, there's a throat to choke, which is Aaron's, um, and uh, <laughs> we have support and we have all those different things that, that some of those micro -frame, frameworks uh, don't offer. 
So, so that, that, I think that's important in certain, in certain cases that we see. Language. I would also add. I would also add to that that that, that the design of, of both XJS and Sentient Touch uh, is, and, and it's, it's, it's. I think it's unique. Uh, in the framework world, uh, the JavaScript framework world, is we've taken a language which is prototypical by nature and turned it into a, classical, a language of classical inheritance, uh, which enables uh, developers, uh, all of you obviously are here at, at Spring One because you're Java developers of one type or another, uh, who are used to uh, classical development, and now you can step into the JavaScript world uh, with a classical, albeit not exactly the same, but it, it's, it's close enough so that if, for example, you take Architect and you are able to, many organizations are using Architect as a teaching tool as well, along with training, uh, to see the way that the uh, JavaScript is, is laid out, the, component, the componentized nature of it, and the class-based uh, class nature of it, um, and, and it's, a, it's a much shorter learning curve uh, to a much more powerful uh, design. Of, I, did, I did a lot of ActionScript and Flex prior to uh, uh, coming to Sentia, and, and the transition was fairly easy because the, um, of the, 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 the class-based nature of Sentia. So I think that, and I think that's unique. I don't think that's uh, really uh, visible anywhere, anywhere else with, with another, another framework to the extent that we have it. Great. Well, there's a price tag for the for the mouse framework. The, we are we are we're dual licensed. We have uh, uh, GPL v3 licenses of both frameworks, and we also have commercial licenses of both of both frameworks. Now, the uh, Sentient Touch framework, even under commercial license, is free, and we made that decision because we are interested in overall adoption. Um, the XJS library uh, has a price tag on it, and of course, support has a price tag on it. Architect has a price tag on it. Uh, but many of the tools, Command, for example, is free. Um, and, and, and we make uh, a lot of our business model, of course, is on uh, OEM licensing, where organizations are exposing abilities to change and modify UI and build apps and things like that. Um, so yes, there is, a, there, there is a price tag. But I would also say, as the point I made earlier, if you're using a micro framework, um, you're undoubtedly, unquestionably, without any I think argument from anyone in the room going to need more than one to handle all of the aspects that you need to do to write a full featured application, which at that point in time makes you the framework vendor. And that also, for your time, has a price. So it's a question of, first of all, if you're using touch, it's free. If you're using the desktop, there is a price. It's not that high, $329, not that bad. Um, and certainly your time is better spent on your business problem than your framework problem, I, I, in my opinion. So guys, I know we're, we're running right up against the time. If you guys have questions, come up to us. Sure. Um, we'll be right so here. if you want to keep in touch with us, these are our emails. Um, I'm on Twitter a little bit uh, once in a while. I'll probably post pictures of my cat, so you might not really want to follow me. But um, if you guys want to email us, if you guys have questions, we'll be around. Um, come get us. Thank you all very much. My name is John Ferguson. This Luke is Lou. This is Spring Essential.